All right, welcome everyone. And thank you for joining this online practice session with Tricycle today. I'm really happy to introduce Roshi Pat Enkyo O'Hara as our guest teacher today. Roshi is a Soto priest and teacher in the Harada Yasutani lineage of Zen Buddhism. Roshi is abbot and founder of the village Zendo in New York City and is also a founding teacher of the Zen Peacemaker Family, a spiritual and social action association. Um, today we're on a Zoom webinar, so the participant audio and video are off. Um, we are recording a session for anyone unable to attend live, and you can view the recordings as well as the schedule for our upcoming sessions at tricycle.org slash live, where you can also make a donation to support these free offerings. Um, at the end of today's session, we'll have some time for Q&A with Roshi, so you can post your questions in the Q&A panel, which is accessible through the button below the video screen. It says Q&A. And we'll get to as many questions as we can toward the end of today's call, which goes for about an hour. And if you're joining us on Facebook Live, then you can also post a question in the comments there and we'll add it to the queue. So thank you so much to you, Roshi, for being with us today. And I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Donya. I'm just looking to see if I can see people here, speak with you. No, guess not. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to this practice time. You know, I really appreciate Tricycle for offering this uh, and hosting this opportunity uh, for us to stop and practice during this, this really difficult time. Brian. Oh, now I see I can see the gallery view. Oops, maybe not. Um, Anyway, I see your flags popping up of the various people that have come to gather today for us to practice together. Uh, you know, it's so easy for us to be frightened or angry or sad about what's going on. So it's really important to take the time to tune in to ourselves and one another so that we can practice our true intention. And I, I've been just appreciating all the different styles uh, and traditions of teaching uh, that these sessions have offered. It's so helpful. Uh, in these times, we need to appreciate all of the offerings that are given to us, what we call Buddhism, the many ways that we approach wisdom and compassion the different pathways that we may take that will help us during this, this really difficult time. Perhaps some of you are just now uh, tuning in uh, after reading news or working, managing family. Uh, so I think the begin way to begin that would be very helpful for all of us, and certainly for me, is to just take a few short minutes to stop and reset ourselves a little. And then after a short time of sitting, maybe five minutes, uh, we can, I'll, I'll offer some perspectives from my own, own experience in the Dharma. And after that, we can meditate even longer. And then after that, we can have a discussion. We can hear from one another. So for right now, let's take a breath in. Try and sit comfortably if you can, or find an easeful position for you. If you can sit upright, that works really well. Allow your gaze to soften. Maybe let it rest a few feet away from you. Your eyes slightly open. And then take a breath in. Taking in the air around you. Allowing your tummy to expand slightly. 
And with ease, breathe out. Allowing the tummy to just drop back gently to the rest position. And just we'll together continue breathing in and breathing out. Just let's savor each breath. Just savor each moment. And I'll ring a bell after a few minutes.
Just take a moment or so to appreciate uh, that short little time where you opened a space for yourself in this Zoom room uh, that we share. Um, while we were sitting, I noticed these flags coming up, people joining uh, a little late. And so uh, what I had said before was uh, how grateful I am to be here and uh, that we would sit for a few moments just to settle ourselves before considering some of the crisis that we're in and how we can meet it as followers of the way. After I speak for a few moments, we'll have a chance to sit even for, for a longer amount of time. As much I understand it, it is the main uh, focus of these meetings. Um, I'm speaking to you from New York City, uh, Lower Manhattan, uh, in what is one of the most intensive centers of the COVID pandemic. This city uh, has known plagues in the past from the smallpox plague uh, that the Europeans brought and infected so many of the original inhabitants, uh, the speakers of the Algonquin language here. And then there were recurrent episodes among the immigrants and the poor and vulnerable here, scarlet fever, cholera, typhoid, influenza, over and over again, devastating the poor and the vulnerable in the slums, just like today. Later, there was polio and HIV. And again, hitting of the vulnerable, those without medical uh, ability to have medical services. And yet, you know, New York is not really any different from any city in any country. And being vulnerable to disease, to as the Buddhist teachings have it, old age, sickness, and death. The earliest Buddhist teachings remind us that there is suffering, that suffering does arise as an aspect of life. And so much of our practice is about how do we meet that suffering? How can we manage our own hearts and minds so that we can offer compassion and stability, so that we can offer service when so many are in distress? I think by virtue of the fact, fact that you've shown up today, that this is a concern that you may have. How to be fully present in this world. Where can I go? How, what can I do? How can I place myself so that I can face this suffering and serve? So recently I was studying uh, a book of uh, women uh, Zen ancestors and uh, I came across one woman, a uh, really early modern 17th century uh, master in China, uh, who whole question in life, her koan of life was, where's the place I can settle myself and establish my life? Where's the place I can settle myself and establish my life? So right now, in this time, sickness, poverty, race and class struggle, I think all of us are asking ourselves that question. Where is the place we can settle ourselves, establish our lives, be able to serve now 
the way things are. Because it's so easy to get triggered into an unhelpful response. It's easy to hide. You know, just the other day, I have to confess, I was on my daily walk in my neighborhood, uh, and I witnessed myself uh, falling into a rage at those who were not wearing masks. Um, you know, we're, we're, in, we have, we're kind of crowded here, and so you're not six feet away from someone who's running by or walking by. Um, I wanted everyone on the street to care about the well-being of others on the street. And that certainly wasn't the case and is not the case every time I go out the door. But the rage that I felt, <laughs> the desire to correct everyone, I had to ask myself, where's the place I can settle myself? and truly serve life without anger. Where is the place we can meet the suffering in the world? With an open heart. And of course, the Buddhist teaching is very clear on this. The only place is to find the sanctuary within ourselves. So, I said that and my phone rang. <laughs> this is modern life. Where is the place we meet the suffering in the world? In our own hearts. We must create our own sanctuaries. You know, a sanctuary is a, is a refuge. Uh, a spiritual home and we think of it as you know a building uh, perhaps wherever you sit you think of as your sanctuary for your your community uh, meditation halls and um, churches uh, temples uh, maybe just your cushion your meditation cushion is your sanctuary and I, I think all of the traditions offer stories and offer techniques for us to find our sanctuary that's in our hearts. Um, and in my tradition, of course, we, we study koans, we study Zen stories that have teach, teaching stories is what they are. And there's one that I, I'm very fond of that I'll share with you uh, very quickly. Uh, it's a story about, it's in the uh, Book of Serenity, and it's a story about uh, Shakyamuni Buddha walking, taking a walk with his congregation. I'm sure you, you have read many, uh, many stories about that, the, the way that Shakyamuni would walk with his community to these different places. And, and they were on a walk uh, with his followers. Uh, and all of a sudden, Shakyamuni looks over and points to the ground and says, this spot is good to build a sanctuary. And alongside him uh, was Indra, so you know this is a story, who was walking along with Shakyamuni. And so he immediately reached down, picked up a blade of grass, stuck it in the ground and said, the sanctuary is built. And they're walking along. This would be a good place for a sanctuary. The sanctuary is built. Simple. How can I find my sanctuary when I'm walking down the street and I see people disregarding the guidelines that our community has set out to save one another? to protect one another. How can we find our point of practice, that place of practice exactly in the middle of our lives, rather than falling into a kind of reactive or hopelessness? So 
So the story is, is great because it's just, it's so direct. It points right, it's right here. So for us right now, it's right here where we are, all over the world, right here. But of course, it's not so easy to find our sanctuary. Where can we settle ourselves? Can't it be your simple breath? Your in-breath and your out-breath? Can it be the spring? Or if you're below the equator, the autumn, the color of the morning sky, maybe the sound of ambulances, and you find the sanctuary there. It's always available if we're willing to see it. We can remember that it's always there. So I'm going to offer us just some time to do that, to enter our own sanctuary, to enter our calm and steady body, no matter how old or young, how fit or ill, just enter the sanctuary. Breathing in and breathing out. There's nothing fancy. It's just inhabiting our sanctuary. So I'll, I'll ring the bell and we can sit for some time. Breathing in and breathing out. So if you haven't had a chance yet, do find a comfortable seated position if possible. I find it very helpful to place my tongue up against my the roof of my mouth by my front teeth. And that, that feels like a signal to the body. I am whole, I am here, I am a sanctuary. Sit in a position that doesn't require a lot of movement. Sit with your eyes partially open if you can, but if you're accustomed to sitting with your eyes closed, of course, that's fine. It's about your sanctuary. Just breathing in and breathing out. Not too fancy just real.
Nice to just take a moment or so to reset your posture. Stretch your legs if necessary. And appreciate what you've just given yourself. Space for sanctuary. space to be present to this life, these moments, in appreciation no matter how hard things are, that you can create your own sanctuary. So, Danya, maybe we could have some comments from folks. Sure. Um, thank you so much, Roshi. That was wonderful. And I just read this comment from Judith who wrote gratitude and appreciation for an oasis to create sanctuary together, which is very much what this felt like. So um, I'm going to open it up for questions. If you have a question, please use the Q&A panel below the video screen. Um, we've got a couple coming in. So I'm actually going to start with one clarifying question, which I had, which was, um, you mentioned this uh, koan earlier from an early Buddhist practitioner, um, where is the place I can settle myself and establish my life? I was wondering who that was. That was uh, Master Shijong, was her name, uh, 17th century uh, Zen, woman Zen master. There, there are several books now, and I'll have to send them around, uh, the title and authors, uh, it's not here in my mind right now, that list various uh, women's Zen masters, particularly from China, um, from the early days. Um, so her name was Shigong Shizong, and that's spelled Z-H-I-Z-O-N-G. Thank you. All right. So Orlando asks, in this time of physical distancing, when social connection is needed more than ever, how can we best maintain as practitioners a sense of sangha, of community, while maintaining safe physical distance for as long as needed? It's a, it's a wonderful question, and uh, it's what we're doing right now. Uh, we are gathering I don't know, see, I think maybe there are 99 people here or more gathering. Uh, and so it's like we have, it's time to reinterpret our idea of what distance is. Uh, there are people from all over the world that are connecting. If you are to have good fortune to be in a community, I mean, Tricycle is a community, so you can use Tricycle for that. Uh, in my own, uh, we have a temple here. We call it a temple. It's in a loft space in lower Manhattan. Uh, and we have about 100 members. And uh, we, uh, we have Zoom sittings in the morning and in the evenings. So that is one way uh, to enter that space. So that can be done electronically. And then the rest depends on where you live and, and how you you interact with, I mean, I'm in an urban situation, so it's hard for me to, to answer for someone in a very rural place, but I go to the farmer's market and, and we, we talk to the farmers <laughs> 10 feet away. <laughs> uh, and uh, so there is a, an intimacy that you can achieve, either electronically, when we're so fortunate to have that, or face-to-face, -face, but at a distance. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, it's a really interesting opportunity to get creative, I think. That's I uh, sit out on my fire escape sometimes and wave to people who are sitting on their fire escape across the street. And oh, Danya, have a that's, form a, of connection. <laughs> that's a great response. And someone, told, someone sent me an email that said that she sits on her stoop in Brooklyn and everybody sits on their stoops. And uh, they wave at one another, just what you're saying. That's beautiful. And we all go outside and clap. I live in a kind of like projects where there are all these big buildings across. We can see one another and we're like doing that. Clapping for the medical care people. 
Yeah, I've got that too. That's wonderful. Um, we have someone who asked, how do you approach your thoughts when they come in while you are sitting? Well, I, I try to just when they arrive, I try to put them down gently. Like, oh, you're here, this thought, but not now. It's kind of, uh, it kind of as if you had a, a, little, a puppy or a cat or a little toddler. And you just have to say, I love you, but not now. Uh, and and uh, the other thing that I do, I, I, I'm a very physical person. Uh, and so, uh, again, I mentioned my tongue up against my teeth. I press a little bit, have a, a bring myself back to my physical self, which then makes me realize, okay, the thought is a soft thing that's coming in, but I'm, I'm here and I'm in charge uh, of this situation. So in, to, to re remember, come back to the membership of your life in that moment. I hope that helps. I, I, thoughts keep coming. That's the, that's the function of the mind, is what it, the mind does. And so it, we're not bad for that, but we, we, just as this person is saying, we don't want to do that at, during the time of meditation, trying to open ourselves to the vast emptiness. So we just kind of gently push the thoughts away. So a number of people are writing questions about working with the anger that arises and the, perhaps in feeling that other people are not acting correctly. And someone just wrote, Randall asked, so how did you transform in that moment, your rage being in the public at that moment that someone around you is not using personal protection? Well, Randall, it's not easy. <laughs> A rage, that's my thing. I mean, I, I'm kind of an angry person and that's why. <laughs> <laughs> I took up this practice uh, to help me, uh, and uh, I have to laugh at myself a little bit. I mean, I'm like the hall monitor in the school, right? I want everyone to behave correctly. <laughs> so uh, the management is very similar to what the previous person's question about thoughts. It's what the moment we're aware of, uh, of our anger. I mean, when we're not aware of our anger, we're just react, we're in pure reaction mode. So that one of the blessings of meditation is to teach us to recognize quickly that we've shifted into an anger mode. I mean, otherwise we're just unconsciously angry, it's just rage is coming. So the minute we see it, oh, here's anger. And to remember in that moment what the cause of this anger is our love, our caring for all beings, our caring for the safety of others. And we look at this person and we don't know. We might have a lot of opinions about why they're not wearing a mask. Uh, could it be they couldn't afford one, didn't have an opportunity, don't understand? I mean, you know, it, it's very easy to build an idea. They must be on some, from a different political point of view, but that may not be the case. So just opening and opening and opening your understanding. That's how I would work with that particular occasion of anger. Thank you. Um. Lou asks, how can we diminish the anguish that we feel inside? Diminish the anguish. Yeah. So it, the anguish, first of all, is, can be appropriate. The anguish that I feel for those who do not have enough food right now in my city. People who have lost their jobs, have lost their income. So what can I do? Is there something that I can do to be of service in this way? Can I find an organization or a, 
a plan or a way of thinking about and putting pressure on uh, the, the cause of this anguish? Can I make some kind of active difference uh, is the way that I have to work with, with the anguish that I feel uh, when these things arise, uh, is the great suffering that's around us. And if the suffering is internal, if it's our own fear uh, or our own uh, grief at our loved ones or our own, the danger in, of us, then also, what can I do to, to open this anguish this, and recognize its good part, which is caring, and recognize also its negative impact, that it's not helping, that it's building more anguish. So to open the heart, ask the question, what is this that I'm feeling? And then find remediating ways to move in a direction of healing. And I hope that's helpful, Lou. Thank you. Next, we have a question from Diana. How do we deal with the fear of the future? I think it's healthy to have uh, <laughs> concern and fear of the future uh, for our personal lives and uh, our, the, our lives in the world and, and for others. I think a, a, a healthy amount of fear is, is, is good. If it paralyzes, then it's not good. It doesn't work. If it paralyzes us and prevents us from taking action, then it's a negative force. And so the fear, if we look at it thoughtfully and carefully with love, you see, oh, I'm afraid for the harm of the planet, the country I live in, the city I live in, my neighbors, my family, myself. These are the different levels. And on each level, is there something that I can do? Are there people that I can work with to make a difference? So that, this, so that our the energy of fear that can be like closing us and pulling us back, the energy of fear can actually push us forward into working with others to make a difference. I hope that makes sense. Yes, thank you. Um, Susan, I think, asked a follow-up question of why is anguish treated differently from anger or thoughts? Ah. Why is, say it again, I'm sorry, I'm a little dumb here. No. <laughs> why is anguish treated differently from anger or thoughts? I see, I see. I don't think it is. Maybe in my explanation, I was coming from a different per perspective. Uh, Anguish is, uh, ang anguish, as I understand it, is individual personal suffering. But thoughts uh, are the trigger, or are, are triggered by that personal suffering, and then trigger more personal suffering. So I, I don't see a, a contradiction in, in what I was saying. The different, tech, different strategies uh, to to work with, you know, our, our minds are so creative in both positive and negative ways. And um, we have to take care of ourselves and others by really being alert to the energies that are arising. All right. Um... Dallas asks, how do we remain steadfast in our serenity as we deal with the anger of others and their fear? Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, it's very hard, isn't it? Because uh, what I'm hearing in that question is, is a situation where the person is okay, steadfast, feeling good. And then what comes in is uh, the anger, you know, part perhaps a partner or a relative or a loved one uh, where they are suffering and uh, and we're feeling that energy come in and how do we how do we turn it without re being reactive um, 
for me, in those kinds of situations, it's a matter of taking a breath, not unlike what I was saying about, you know, when I see this guy on the street and I want to, <laughs> I want to have a reactive person inside myself, but when the, the anger is coming from outside, and certainly Zen teachers, we see a lot of that. Um, we open our hearts to the brokenness of where it's coming from and say, ah, how can I serve that? How can I serve you now in that? There was a second part to that question and I forgot what it was. Oh, um, I think it was just as we deal with the anger of others and their fear, so uh -huh. how do we yeah. remain steadfast? Right, right, well, the, yes. It is a wonderful feeling to feel to yourself steadfast. And that's why I really encourage everyone, you know, this is, I was talking about sanctuary or meditation or sit, Take the time to really settle yourself so that you can serve others. That is how we are able to do it without creating more problems, more difficulties, more suffering. But when we're settled, when we're steadfast, which is a great word, when we're steadfast, we're able to do that. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, there's so many good questions here. Um, what is your perspective? This might be a big one. What is your perspective on depression experienced by a practitioner? Mm -hmm. Well, in our life, there are times when, uh, you know, our our life goes like this and there, and uh, sometimes the depression is clinical, it needs to be uh, dealt with, uh, working with a psychotherapist or a physician. Uh, and uh, a lot of times depression is, is an aspect of, of one's, one's physical health. Uh, so that's one part of it. And some people are often drawn, I found in my life, uh, and the Dharma that people come to this to to our temple and they want to uh, be cured of their depression but actually what needs to happen is they need to take care of some physical uh, and psychological issues and sometimes just the action of coming to a uh, practice place uh, whatever kind and uh, sitting and realizing oh I really need to do some work here on depression, uh, then that might spur a person to action to take uh, some healing steps. Um, and, uh, you know, depression comes and goes with many people. It's hard, it's hard to talk abstractly about it because there are so many different levels of, uh, you know, there's sadness and then there's uh, clinical depression or there's a huge range. Um, and uh, if, you're see if you seek out a, a spiritual answer to uh, what is a medical problem, that's a problem. So I just want to offer that. Well, thank you so much, Roshi, um, for sharing this opportunity um, with us today. And thank you to everyone who joined us on this call. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just say a few closing words. We are providing these sessions for free. So if you'd like to help support this and other offerings at this time, please consider donating at trischool.org slash donate. Um, we have another online practice session coming up this Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern time with Mark Epstein. And you can check tricycle.org slash live for the upcoming session dates and to view the recordings of all of these sessions as well. Um, and I, I wish everyone health and safety in this time. And many, many thanks to you, Roshi, for being with us today. Thank you, Danya. It was lovely. Thank you.